Hello and welcome to a new Oxygen XML webinar. Thank you for joining us. My name is George Bina and I will be your host today. And I invited my colleague Alex Gitiano to discuss about unit testing, XSLT scripts and Schematron schemas using uh, the XPEC framework. Before Alex we start uh, his presentation, I want to provide you some useful information uh, uh, answering some of the usual questions that we receive. Is the webinar recorded? And the answer is yes, uh, the recording will be available on the event page as well as on our YouTube Oxygen XML channel. And I encourage you to uh, maybe uh, subscribe to that channel because it has a lot of uh, interesting uh, other interesting uh, uh, videos. How and when uh, to ask questions? You should ask questions using either the questions panel in the GoToWebinar interface or if you are or if you prefer using Twitter you can address uh, your questions to the Oxygen XML account or just mark them with the Oxygen XML hashtag and uh, we'll monitor that channel as well. And uh, your questions can be asked at any time, so feel free to, to ask them during uh, the presentation. I will try to respond them uh, as uh, you ask them, but uh, at the end of the webinar, we have a reserved uh, questions and answers section, and we'll go through the questions uh, uh, also, also then. So now I will uh, make Alex uh, presenter so he can share his screen and uh, start his presentation. Hi Alex. Hello everybody. Thank you for attending this presentation. My name is Alex Gitianu. Th I'm a member of uh, the Oxygen team and um, thank you for attending this webinar in which we will talk about unit testing and how it, it applies to developing XSLTs and Schematron. A few words about today's agenda. First, we will present the concept of unit testing and how they uh, how it applies to XSLT development. I will introduce the XPEC framework to you and show you how um, it can be used to develop these uh, unit tests. And for the practical part, we will be developing some XPEC unit tests for XSLT and afterwards for Schematron. And we will use uh, Oxygen uh, for that. See how we can uh, leverage to its full potential the support that Oxygen offers for the XPEC framework. So before we begin, um, the question, the, the important question is why do unit testing matters? Um, I myself, I have heard um, many people say, um, why should I write tests for my code? Um, my code is rock solid tests are just a waste of time. Well, that's so not true. Not only that tests aren't a waste of time, they actually increase the speed of development. And why am I saying that? Well, because the less tests you write, the less robust or stable your code becomes, which means that when you will ch make changes into that code, when you will add a new functionality, there's a greater chance that you will break things, other things. And that leads to more things to fix, which in turn means you will have less time for developing new features so you will decide to write less tests because you don't have any time left for tests. And 
this is actually where it all begins with this decision to skip writing tests. And because of that, you've entered into a sort of a spiral. Your code will go from good to bad to worse, which will eventually eventually lead to maybe such a release day when bugs will try to get out <laughs> and you'll be the development team here in the trenches trying to fix things uh, under a lot of pressure. And believe me, you, you don't want to be uh, in this position. So I'll leave you two more seconds to enjoy this um, <laughs> great uh, comic. And so I hoping that I've convinced you that more tests means less stress. Let's define what a unit test is. Well, what defines a unit test? It's, it, it's the fact that it verifies the behavior of a small part of the application. So you're not testing the entire application, just a, a small part of it. And because of that, such a test, it is quite easy to implement. And when it fails, you will know exactly where the fault is. It's somewhere in that small part of the application. So you won't be searching for a needle in a haystack. This brings us to the next uh, concept, that of test-driven development. Now, test-driven development, it's a software development process in which you begin with tum, 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 writing a test. I bet you saw that coming, right? So the first step is to describe the behavior, aka you write a test. You test next. The next step is to test if the code has that behavior. So you execute the test. And if it doesn't, you start to develop the code until it does, which means the test passes. If you develop your code that way, on the long run, you will have what is called regression tests, which means that when you add new functionality into your project, that functionality will not break the existing one because you have all those tiny unit tests covering all the existing functionality. And that brings another benefit, that, that you can refactor without fear. Refactoring is a healthy habit in software development. Um, so the fact that you, but not always do people, um, refactor their code because, uh, like I said, they are afraid that they might break existing functionality. But because of these unit tests, you can rest assured that as soon as you break something, uh, you'll know and you'll be able to fix it right then and not on that um, fatidic release day that we saw earlier. Yes, I'm, I'm still shivering from, from that slide. So how does test-driven development applies to XSL team? Well, just as we discussed, you focus on the expected behavior. And for XSLT, such behaviors might be uh, enunciated like this. When processing a short description element, my style sheets should create a P element or a more complex behavior when processing an a FN element here that has a label attribute, my style sheets should create a P element with a sub 
child holding the text of the label attribute. That's another example of such a behavior. Well, this brings us to the XPEC framework, which is a unit testing and behavior driven development framework for XSLT and more recently uh, for Schematron. And it is an open source framework. It has an account on GitHub where you can go and check things out. You can um, add requests for certain features. And version one was released um, at the beginning of the year. Actually, the Schematron unit testing feature um, was one of its major uh, additions in this uh, version and they are actually preparing a new release for this week version 1.1 so it's a mature project and it's well maintained and thus I think it's worth considering as a framework for writing your unit tests well now it's time to take a look at how this XPEC framework is integrated into Oxygen. But to present all that, um, let's start with a real life use case with some samples. Let's have some um, uh, goals that we want to, uh, to achieve. So for, um, for this part, we will try to apply the test-driven development for XSLT. So let's assume that my project has some XML documents that contain information about books. And each book has a title, an author, a price, and the date when it was published. And I have a lot of XSLTs that publish this information into, uh, let's say, HTML. Let's see how test-driven development works for XSLT using XPEC as the framework and Oxygen as the um, development tool. So I will switch to Oxygen. Oh, I was in a hurry before switching to Oxygen. Let's identify some behaviors for our project. Well, one such behavior could be that the dates published in HTML should be in a format like this one. So first the day, then the month, and then the year. Another one could be that uh, these given books should have the total price of uh, this number. So. Um, I have to, I want to verify that I'm correctly computing the total price for a set of books. And remember, always start with a test. So now let's switch to oxygen. And in my project, I have an XML file which contains some books and I have my style sheet this one and so one of the behaviors was to compute to verify that I'm correctly computing the total price of a books I don't yet have this functionality so I will just create the skeleton of a function let's call it compute total price which has one parameter name books and I won't write any implementation I'm just uh, returning something so my uh, function returns something and I can test it um, right now I also noticed that um, Oxygen gives me a warning here. It says that 
there is no documentation for the function, for this function that I've created. And this is a healthy behavior also to add documentation from for your XSLT components because uh, in the future when something will break and you'll need to debug the function, uh, these doc documentation uh, blocks can help a lot. So I will use one, the, one of the provided quick fixes, which is to add a documentation block for this function. And I can say that this function computes the total price for the given books. I can put something uh, for the parameter as well. And if I consider, if I deem it necessary, I can even give more details about what this function returns, like maybe the total price or minus one if um, the books don't have a title. Um, any information I uh, consider um, important uh, for understanding how, how this, this function works. And another aspect why these documentation blocks are important is because of Oxygen's um, generate documentation feature. So if you generate the documentation for a style sheet, the, you have this action on the toolbar here. Um, the documentation, it's in HTML format, and these these descriptions blocks will also be here in um, in in the documentation of your style sheet. So it it's a healthy habit that I I hope you will um, get it yourself. You will acquire. Uh, okay, so now I have my function. Let's start with a test. Let's create that test. For that, I will go in the project view on the XSLT file, and from the contextual menu, I will choose the XSLT unit test action. I will go with the default name for this new um, unit test file, and I will just choose customize. And in this page, I am presented with all the templates and functions from my style sheets. Um, it's something to help me um, get getting started, it's to get started. Um, so Oxygen will generate um, a stub, a skeleton test to test um, each and every one of um, these templates or function that you deem necessary. But for now, for my behaviors, I will start with um, two scenarios for these two functions. So let's choose create. And this is how an XPEC file looks like. So for each unit test, you have a scenario element which has a label that describes the behavior of the scenario. And in it, you can call a function or you can uh, call a template or if you just give a context, um, all the templates that match that context will be executed. But for our case, we will call the compute total price function here and the format date in that other scenario. Now, to focus on, uh, on specific scenarios, in my case, I want to focus, let's say, on the scenario that com computes the total price. I will go on that other scenario and put the pending attribute to true. This means that this particular scenario 
should not be executed because it's not ready or uh, for other other reasons anyway let's focus on the first scenario so i see here that the compute total price function is being called and that it has a parameter named books and for this parameter i will take from my instance document two books and i will put them here so this will be the value for the books parameter and um, to test the results you use these expect elements they have they also have a label to describe their behavior the total price for the books and um, for the value we can since it returns an integer integer we can put it like this zero uh, oh no actually the total price should be uh, 18 plus 25 uh, 43 so this value should be uh, what my function uh, returns for these given books uh, now I want to test if my function has this behavior which obviously it doesn't because um, I just created a, a skeleton for that function but to execute this scenario I will go on the toolbar and I will click the apply transformation scenario so oxygen provides a transformation scenario that will execute your expect file and the result is in HTML format it will be open in the browser and I see here that although the expected result is 43 the actual result is zero and because of that this function uh, this test has failed and it's marked as such and that other scenario of mine you see that it's grayed out uh, which is a hint that uh, it was actually skipped it, it is marked as pending right so now I will go in the style sheet on that particular function and I will start developing the code until it has the desired behavior and it returns the correct value so we will use the sum function to uh, get to and let let's assume that I make a mistake so instead of uh, adding all the prices uh, the prices for all the books I will just uh, um, get the price from one of the books and I, I return to the expect file and I execute the scenario again and it is still failing instead of 43 this time it produced 18 so my code doesn't have the required functionality the, the required behavior yet so i return to to the xslt again this time i correct the error back to the xpec and run it again and finally um, things worked as they should and the unit tests are passing and the code has um, the desired behavior um, now I won't uh, write the second scenario but instead let's focus on so this is how uh, an expect framework scenario looks like you already saw it in action um, you also seen 
We also seen the expect wizard, how Oxygen provides validation and content completion while working on expect scenarios. And um, I've also shown you the built-in transformation scenario. You need to execute these scenarios. But um, now I want to talk about the expect helper plugin. So this plugin was born as a result from user feedback. When we presented a while back uh, the XPEC support uh, at XML Prague, um, we received a lot of um, good feedback uh, from the people attending. Um, as uh, a lot of those people um, had already had also worked with other um, programming languages. So they were accustomed with a deeper integration for writing unit tests. So for example, they wanted some sort of a specialized view that will present the, the results um, of the unit test. So you don't have to go back and forth between Oxygen and the browser. Also, um, when when a, a test is failing, um, to fix what's wrong with the code, you need to work on the XSLT. So you should be able to work on, a, on, a, on the XSLT and then just uh, execute the, the unit test again without having to switch between the XSLT and the XPEC uh, files like, like I did in the, uh, a while back. So this is how this XPEC helper plugin was um, was born to address these issues and to present it um, as a use case. We'll take the regression test use case. So let's assume that um, at some point in the in the past, I've created a lot of such unit tests. And now I've added functionality into my project and I want to see if I broke any existing functionality, if I ha have any regressions. So how to get the, first of all, how to get this XPEC helper plugin? Well, it's quite simple, quite easy. In Oxygen, you go to help, um, install new add-ons, and from the combo box on, on the top of the dialog, you select the community update site and you will see two components, two add-ons, a framework and a plugin. Um, in my case, they are grayed out because I've already installed them, but you will be able to select them and then follow the installation um, procedure and after a restart, um, you will have on the toolbar this green uh, button to run expect test scenarios. So the regressions tests. So I have this file, it's called books underscore tests, which has a few scenarios I've created a while back, like I said. And I want to see if um, they pass if um, the behavior they test uh, still exists. So I will click this action on the toolbar, the run expect test scenario. And you should notice this uh, helper view here, it's called the expect test results. And in it, I will see the results of my tests. So as you see, I have three tests that are failing. Actually, all of them are failing. Um, what I can do in this view is if I click show, I will be uh, uh, located in, in uh, the expect file at the specific assertion that is failing. And if I click the quick diff here, 
I will see um, the differences between the expected results and the actual results. This is something uh, identical with what you've seen in the browser. So uh, we try to, uh, it is, the changes are rendered uh, through background colors. And while it might be quite easy to understand what's happening uh, if the assertion is uh, simple enough, if you have a, a larger uh, XML fragment that you assert, then it might be difficult to understand from this kind of uh, visualization what the actual changes are. Uh, here the, the div element is red because something inside it is different. The element itself is, is the same, but that might not be uh, obvious at, at, at the first sight. So when this happens, what you can do is you um, is to click this diff button, and Oxygen diff tool will be launched, and in it uh, you will be able to see uh, the changes more clearly. So for example, here the I was expecting an H1 element but my style sheets actually produced an H2 element. And here I was expecting the name of the author, which is missing. And this other one, it's actually uh, uh, something useful that you can do in XPEC. Um, if you're not interested in the in asserting the content of a specific element, you can just put three dots here and expect we will know that uh, this part doesn't uh, matter. But um, Oxygen Diff Tool <laughs> doesn't know this convention. So let's fix our style sheet. Uh, let's start with the first scenario. So the scenario that um, asserts uh, how a book heading is formatted. For that, I will go into my style sheet on the uh, print book title template. This is the, the template that was called here in, in the scenario. And after taking a closer look at this template, I noticed that indeed here it should say H1 and as far as the author goes at the first glance it looks like I'm I've done everything right but you should notice that oxygen gives you a warning here it says that the expat expression references a book element and you already have a parameter with that name and so maybe you've made a, a confusion and that's exactly what uh, the error here is because I wanted to take the author from my uh, book parameter. So I fix this and um, I can run the scenarios again. And this time, this uh, first scenario um, succeeds. Now let's focus on the second one. Now, um, if if I want to focus on the scenarios that are failing, I have this action on the toolbar to show only failures. So if I click it, you see only only the failed scenarios remain. Um, so let's see what's wrong with the date assertion. I'll use oxygen diff. Um, so I'm expecting to have the day first followed by the month and is the other way around. The, the, the way the date is formatted is to put the month first and the day afterwards. 
So now that I understand what why this uh, test is failing, I can go to the XSL T again, this time on the format date function, uh, because I've because my unit tests test a small part of the application in this case in this case the format date then i know exactly where to go and where to fix the issue and indeed i noticed that the format here is not the correct one and i change it and i can um, I can run just this scenario if I want instead of uh, the entire expect file. And this time I see that the date format scenario as well uh, passes. But I had one more scenario that failed, the one about uh, an ordered list being used in the outline. This one over here, this, this is the scenario. And the difference is that instead of unordered lists, um, I'm getting ordered list. This is a easy enough thing to fix. So I'll go again to the style sheet. And on on, on the template that matches the books element in the outline mode, uh, I noticed oh, I notice also that this scenario, when it provides the context, it specifies in which mode um, this fragment should be processed. So back to the style sheet, and I make the correction, I use an unordered list. Um, and again, I could just execute just this, that, this one scenario, but uh, I want to see that this particular change here doesn't affect other, um, other scenario, other unit tests. So um, I will run all of them. Um, I could also run only the failed scenarios, if um, that's what I wanted. And finally, all my tests are passing. So, hooray, great thing that I had uh, these regression tests. Okay. Back to the slides. Um, now let's talk a bit about Schematron. Uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Schematron, um, just a few words. Um, so Schematron is a way to test XML documents and it is also a rule-based validation language in which you write business rules. And these business rules can enforce um, checks that uh, other schema types like DTD or uh, XML schema or relaxing uh, can't actually enforce. And uh, I, I will uh, show you an example of such a business rule. And another great thing about Schematron is that when you write this business rule, you provide the error message in a form that people can understand. So uh, you don't give cryptic error codes, you uh, state um, useful messages and uh, maybe give hints about how to, to fix uh, that problem. Um, so, an example of a Schematron rule would be this one. Uh, the short description should be a single concise paragraph containing one or two sentences of no more than 50 words. 
Um, now let's assume that my books also have a short description element. Um, the Schematron rule that will enforce this requirement can look like this. So you have a rule element uh, with a context attribute, which is an expat expression. In my case, it should act on which the rule activates. In my case, is the short desk element. And in this rule, I count the number of words by tokenizing the uh, text of, of the short description element. And I make an assertion. I assert, so in this assertion, I test that the number of words should be less or equals equal with 50. And when this rule is broken, when the schematron enc encounters a short desk element with more words, an error, well, in this case, a warning, because it has the role warn, will be issued with this exact message that you've seen uh, above. The short description should be a single concise. So um, the user understands what the problem is and how it should fix it. What's interesting here is also that I've declared an ID on this assertion. And that's important because it relates with how expec tests my schematron files. So uh, how do you create unit tests for schematron in the expec framework? Well, uh, good behavior is to, when you write such unit tests, to include XML that contains errors, which the schematron should catch. And for these cases, you will use the expect element named expect assert, which verifies that the schematron assert is thrown. It's also good to include XML that is valid, which the schematron should pass. So. You want to make sure that these rules don't fire in uh, the wrong uh, context. And for this situation, you will use the expec element named expect not assert, which verifies that a schematron assert is not thrown. And just like these elements, expect has others like expect report uh, to assert the cases when the schematron um, should issue a report or expect not to report for the cases when schematron should uh, not issue a report. So if we look here, I also put um, an example of a scenario. So in this case, I have two books as the context. Uh, one has a short description and the other book has a proper description with just enough words. And uh, my assertions in, in the XPEC is that on the first book, on the short description of the first book, I expect the short the the schematron short description too short uh, assert to be thrown but for the second book the one which has a proper description this particular assert should not be thrown so that's how you write a unit test for schematron now, if we switch to oxygen, I also have a sample for schematron tests. So in this particular file, I have uh, a few scenarios, one that uh, checks that books should have a title, 
uh, another one that has uh, a proper description and asserts that neither well in this case I have um, I I check if descriptions um, I, I want descriptions not to be uh, neither too long nor too short so I have uh, two assertions so for this proper description uh, neither of these assertions should be thrown uh, this other scenario has a short description and for it, I actually expect the short, uh, the too short assertion to be thrown. And I also have a scenario to test uh, with uh, with a long uh, description as input that will um, assert that the short description too long uh, uh, assertion is being thrown. So I have, like I've. Uh, uh, told you before uh, I, I test uh, my test contain uh, valid XML and invalid XML to, to make sure that my schematron um, works uh, as it should in in all uh, contexts uh, to execute it I could either uh, apply the transformation scenario and see the results in in the browser or I can use the plugin that we've seen a, um, a little earlier to execute the expat um, the expect file. So I see that I actually have a failure here. So for this proper description, um, my schematron tells me that it is too long, which is not right. So let's see why this this assertion, this short description too long, um, is being thrown. For that, I will open my schematron file, and I see here the rule on the short description context. Uh, we count the number of words. All is good so far, but the short uh, description too long assertion. I see that here it should say that it should test that the number of words is less or equal than 12. In, in my case, I've uh, chosen 12 instead of 50. It's, uh, it was easier for the presentation's sake. So after I make this change, um, I execute the expect file again and uh, all my unit tests now uh, pass so schematron unit tests like uh, writing tests to test that other tests work quite a cool thing don't you think <laughs> so I hope that I've convinced you that um, writing uh, unit tests is a healthy behavior for both XSLT and, and Schematron. So now you should uh, go and write some tests. And I also hope I've convinced you that test-driven development is great, except uh, if you're building bridges in which case I would suggest a different uh, development process. But you're free to give it a try if you want. Um, thank you very much for bearing with me for, um, for this <laughs> webinar. Um, if you have any questions, now would be the time to ask them. I hope you found um, this presentation useful and you've got um, some ideas on how to improve your XSLT and Schematron projects. So thank you for following me. George? Thank you, Alex. And uh, yes, we already received a number of questions. Uh, I'll need your help also with some of them and some of them sure. I will uh, uh, respond to them. So, 
uh, let's stay closer to uh, what you just presented earlier and uh, uh, there are two questions that relates, relate to uh, uh, schematron report elements rather than assert elements so uh, the question uh, the two questions basically ask if there are uh, similar uh, instructions in uh, the expect scenario to be able to ask rather than uh, yes. asking that an assert is present to uh, check that a report is present or absent yeah, so the, the answer is yes, there are, and they're named in a similar fa uh, fashion. So if I go to Oxygen, um, let's see. So these elements are um, expect report, also with an ID, and expect not report for the, the situations uh, when you want to uh, check to assert that a report is not uh, issued. Okay. Can you please provide a link to the examples? Uh, I think uh, we provide uh, the sample files uh, as uh, part of the downloads that we make available together with the recording and the slides. Yes. So after the webinar, in a couple of days, you should be able to go on the webinar page on our website and you will find there the recording of the webinar, the slides and the sample files. Let's try to go back a bit. So uh, when you presented the documentation of XSLT, there are a couple of questions regarding uh, that documentation markup that uh, you added. And one question was uh, whether the documentation could be nested inside a function. And another question was how does the documentation system know that documentation you added uh, refers to that specific function? Mm -hmm. And the uh, uh, you so, want me to ask, or you? No, I know that I, you know I as well. <laughs> so, so basically, uh, in XSLT, the content in a foreign namespace that you place uh, inside the style sheet element is considered to be annotation, and our documentation uh, generator system uh, will look uh, when it encounters, let's say, a function or a name template in XSLT, it will look at the previous sibling, and if that is an annotation, it's, it's in a content in a foreign namespace, it will consider that to be uh, the documentation for that function. Because if you put a content inside the function, then it becomes important content, it's not an annotation anymore. So that's why we, uh, we use the annotation support from XSLT and the documentation generator looks for that, uh, for those annotations and in, uh, takes them into account. But uh, what's interesting with the documentation is that it works even if you do not have any documentation added, like user documentation, right. because it still creates something quite useful to navigate and understand the structure of your XSLT right. scripts. So. Here I see that uh, the print book templates uh, uses the format date function and if I click it, I will be taken to the format date function and have a look at these parameters maybe. So, and the format date is being used by the print book template. So yes, the, the documentation for an XSLT contains much more uh, information than just this documentation block, but it's still a healthy habit to, to add it. Okay, uh, are there any uh, pre-built expect suites to test the Data Open Toolkit or the Dobook style sheets? Uh, I think this would be useful to verify customizations, but uh, it seems like a daunting task. Uh, well, as I don't know, but as far as I know, 
Yarno Elovirta, the main developer of the Dita Open Toolkit, is aware of XPEC. So, yes, uh, and um, I think he's using XPEC to test certain aspects in uh, in the Dita style sheets. At least I've uh, changed a few uh, emails with him regarding XPEC. So. I, I, I imagine it uses XPEC to, to test but, the but I, open toolkit uh, uh, I'm not sure there is, you know, like a black box kind of text uh, tests for uh, Dita or Dobook already available that you can just take and modify uh, further. So, uh, and in general, unit testing is done on a particular style sheet rather than this kind of, you know, for data open toolkit, you may run uh, a lot of style sheets and the different stages uh, in the processing. So uh, unit testing usually focuses on providing an input to a single style sheet, even that imports some other style sheets. But in case of data OT, there are multiple levels or multiple places or XSLT processing uh, is applied, I think. Another question, at this time related to Schematron and XPEC. It looks like XPEC needs an ID on the uh, Schematron report and Schematron yes. asset rather than on the Schematron rule element. But yes. I had IDs on my rules. Do you recommend moving them on the underlying report or asserts? And uh, I think the answer is because XPEC needs or refers to an assert or report element, then in order to have those references, you need to have IDs on those specific elements. But it's not a question of moving them from the rule to the assert, because in anyway, you have multiple assert or report elements inside the rule. So uh, it's just, you know, if you want to test an assert uh, or check from an expect that an assert or report appears or not, you need to have an ID on uh, on that. Okay. Uh, is there a similar transform uh, of uh, Schematron files available to stub out expect tests? Uh, so this refers to the support that we have to create a new XPEC file from a style sheet. And the question asks if mm. it's possible to create, you know, a, a stub XPEC from uh, a Schematron schema. Well, the answer is not yet, <laughs> but it's an interesting idea. So the the next version of Oxygen might have. <laughs> I have it. Yeah, from my point of view, I think it's it's a bit more difficult because in XSLT you have the um, functions or name templates that are uh, clearly uh, targets for uh, testing unit testing, uh, and uh, or or t templates that match something, but. Um, Probably we can show all the asserts or all yes, the reports IDs. And, uh, with IDs. Yes. Yes, with IDs, and then uh, we can generate something. Maybe taking the 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 message as the label mm -hmm. or something. So that's something uh, 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 a good idea to explore and see if we can come up with something. Can you comment on the? efficiency of processing expect for example does it try to calculate all global variables in a given style sheet and all uh, and its inclusions imports uh, regardless of whether they are used or not are there recommendations uh, you suggest to improve uh, efficiency in running expect modules well um that's more of a question that should be um, directed to the XPEC GitHub uh, account. But as far as I know, <laughs> uh, an XPEC file is being compiled into an XSLT that imports the tested um, XSLT mm -hmm. and uh, invokes 
uh, things on 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 that. Mm. Uh, so so I, then, I don't think it does anything other than that, uh, any processing. Yeah, but that means you know you basically you will import or include all the refer style sheets yes. because you know you cannot actually test the style sheet without that. Uh, and with respect to global variables. Uh, that's usually they are usually not uh, computed unless they are needed. That's an optimization right. done by the by Saxon. by Saxon usually. So uh, you can see that in the debugger, for instance, or things like that. That uh, some global variables, uh, the values for them are not is not available. But although you, as a user, you expect that to be there, but it's. Uh, uh, XSLT processors do lazy evaluation and they will actually compute that when it's actually used for the first time. Does XPEC have support for XSLT 3.0 or XPA 3.0.3.1 features? In particular, uh, could templates that make use of uh, accumulators or high order functions be tested? Um, I would say yes. I think the XSLT 3.0 support was added um, maybe in version one. So mm -hmm. yes, I, I I would say that you can test such uh, such style sheets. I mean, it's um, if if the engine is um, XSLT 3.0 aware, and it is because XPEC uh, scenarios are being run with Saxon. Um, then you should be fine. You receive also a number of uh, congratulations messages. <laughs> <laughs> um, one more thing that I forgot to mention is that um, expect these expect scenarios can also be uh, integrated and run in a continuous integration environment, uh, like for example in Jenkins. And um, there is even um, a Maven plugin, I think, that can uh, execute such um, uh, expect scenario. So um, that's also quite useful. So we should be able to apply the expect processor to multiple expects at a time, uh, and it aggregates uh, the tests output. So that's one uh, another question um, can, uh, can, from the project view, for instance, to uh, oh. be able to apply uh, uh, multiple well, to run basically multiple expect. Uh, okay. Uh, okay, I understand. So um, right now, um, not directly. I mean. Um, Either the apply transformation scenario or this run expect test scenarios works on the current expect file. But what you can do is you can create a driver uh, expect file uh, using the import element. So you can import all of your expect files, or you, you can import uh, the expect file that you want to run in uh, one go. And um, if you execute, if you run this uh, driver expect, uh, all the other expects will be executed. But because this is a, a like a transformation scenario, if I select like uh, two expect files in the in the project view and invoke the apply transformation, um, they should well, run. But then I will yeah, that's see. That's true. Yes. Yes, they will run, and you will see the results uh, separately. But I mean, not aggregated. In the, in the, not aggregated. Exactly. Yes, they will not be aggregated. Okay, so basically, a workaround will be to create like a, a, a driver, or how you call it, mm -hmm. uh, expect. Yes. That, uh, the, yeah. Uh, test one dot expect and ports uh, your expects and then use this just as a trigger. Maybe exactly. add this as a master exactly. file and then you can just uh, mm -hmm. trigger yes. that. Yes. If you want the aggregated uh, results.
and then with that you can take advantage also of this uh, expect uh, test results view yes uh, using this plugin mm -hmm. in previous uh, expect instances i found the debugging flaky often the expect uh, would show a fail but there was no obvious difference between uh, expected and actual I often put it down to white space differences. Is the new expect framework more robust? Can you comment on that? Um, I will say give it another try. <laughs> expect has gone a long way since the days when it was uh, version 0 0.3, I think. So um, now it's a it's a much more mature. Um, product so but uh, i personally don't have uh, any experiences uh, with uh, testing white spaces and previous uh, expect versions uh, yes. with white spaces mm -hmm. <laughs> are there plans uh, to tie expect to the oxygen master files functionality for example when i look for dependencies of a function uh, my expect test does not show up, so I do not know when I have made a change in a function whether I need to adjust an expect test. Uh, likewise, there is no color coding in function in the expect file, and I cannot do as I and I cannot do as I can in order to in other files and hit uh, shift return to move to the definition of the function mm -hmm. so basically following uh, yes uh, I, I know reference I've, I've to noticed... with definition in the style sheet i have noticed uh, this um, missing functionality as well and i recorded an issue um, if i am uh, testing a name template i should be able to control to the, definition name from name from the definition if i am testing a function I should be able, uh, like uh, you said, to uh, go to definition and, and see it. I agree. Because you know the style sheet here, so exactly the style sheet so is present here. We have all the information we need. Yeah, and also refactoring and uh, search dependencies and so on uh, should be an interesting functionality. Of course, it's uh, something to think about, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's not it's not. Uh, that's straightforward because basically now we talk about not XLT and XLT, but cross language <laughs> functionality. So the the go to definition or to follow a reference to its definition, it's uh, it's easier to implement. We need to to analyze a bit better, a bit more what it means for the master files support to understand this. Uh, uh, cross language functionality. It seems like unit testing is as good as the unit test. One needs to think ahead about what can possibly go wrong. If one's invested in unit testing, it seems like this should be a long term recursive process to get the testing right. <laughs> well, uh, you don't necessarily need to think, uh, you know, like everything that can go wrong. You just need to assert what you expect from uh, from right. uh, uh, from that uh, uh, piece of code, like a function yes, or a template, or and then uh, the useful thing is that uh, uh, and that does not have to be on the edge case but rather on the usual case because then if something changes you want to be notified that your expected uh, output is still is not there anymore right and and i agree i mean you <laughs> um, unit testing is as good as your unit tests right <laughs> if you identify correct behaviors and uh, uh, you write uh, enough tests to catch all these situations all these behaviors then yes your unit testing your test driven development will be uh, 
will have a high quality. If not, uh, it won't. Can XPEC be used to test uh, QE fixes? I guess uh, that uh, means Schematron QE fixes, SQF. Uh... I don't have any uh, information about that. No, I think no, I because uh, no. in XPEC you can just point to an assert or a report, but then you you have no way to actually get the QE fix and check that the QE fix is this or that or so so there's no support for for that not that it cannot be added but right now uh what is in expec covers so well, at least from as far as i know can you add mm. something else than checking on the report um so no i would say for quick fixes there's nothing yet but mm. um again it's an interesting idea one should uh, put an issue on the expect GitHub uh, page and uh, see how it goes. Yeah, so so might be a nice request for enhancement yeah. for the expect uh, to support the SQF. Mm -hmm. Although uh, on the expect project, I noticed that is a quefix. Uh, uh, so I'm just looking at the expec and uh, in the tutorial schematron is the quefix.sch file, but I don't know if that means anything or is just you know that the quefix do not break anything or something mm -hmm. like that. So another thing is that the expec guys are uh, aware of uh, SQF, right? Yep. Uh, could expect work uh, on uh, uh, ODD generated schematron constraints? Uh, I think this may be in relation to the TEI, uh, probably the one Definitely. document that it all format. The, the, mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, yes, I got a confirmation that's about that. So, uh, could expect work on ODD generated schematron constraints. So expect can work on any schematron file with the requirement that assert and report elements need to have an ID. So you need to check that the ODD generated schematron constraints define IDs on uh, the assert and report instructions in the in the schematron schema. And if not, then you need to have those IDs. Uh, oh, yes. the schematron is uh, embedded in Relax and GXML. So that's the question. Actually, uh, actually uh, uh, do you know if uh, expect can refer to a relaxing schema and it will extract automatically the schematron? <laughs> From that, probably not. So it's that may be interesting. I, I know it goes an um, an expec file that tests schematron goes through a lot of uh, through a pipeline and um, mm -hmm. it's being processed. Uh, but I, I'll have to look uh, a bit into into that processing. To, to if give an not, uh, adding this support should not be uh, too difficult. I think because it's. Uh, uh, the part that extracts uh, schematron from uh, XML schema or relaxing is uh, already present in the skeleton and it's a style sheet, one page style sheet or something like that. So that can be included in that uh, processing pipeline that you mentioned that is done by XPEC. Anyway, so. So that's another thing to note and maybe to discuss further yep. with you uh, with the expect uh, project members all right so i think we managed to go through uh, all the questions we received and uh, uh, moving on we have uh, a number of upcoming webinars and uh, conferences. So next week, me and Alex will uh, uh, be in uh, New Orleans uh, for the LavaCon conference. 
Uh, and after that, we have uh, a number of other webinars uh, about uh, publishing uh, web help and PDF output. We have a, a publishing templates support that we introduced in uh, in the last version of Oxygen, and we'll go through that and show you how you can use those publishing templates with web help and PDF output, how you can share them. Then Alex again will talk about uh, Oxygen frameworks, frameworks bundle resources and configuration information to support a specific XML language and uh, the data support, dog book support that we have in Oxygen and so on is just uh, a default customization, let's say, of Oxygen, a default framework that is provided with Oxygen to support those XML languages and you can have similar support for your own uh, XML language or for any XML language. We'll come back to Schematron and Schematron Quifix uh, in uh, November with uh, uh, Octavian, our colleague that actually worked with uh, Nico uh, from uh, Data to Type on the SQF, on the SQF uh, specification. Simple data project setup uh, with our uh, with Stephen Higgs, our technical writer, and uh, Radu Koravu will talk uh, on and present a, a lot of uh, oxygen productivity tips and tricks uh, in December, and then we will be at Data Europe and the uh, uh, TC World. But I want to to highlight also the uh, one of the uh, interesting events is the Data Open Toolkit Day. It's a it's a conference that it's a free event uh, that uh, we organize for the Data Open Toolkit project. Uh, so if you can join us, we'll be happy to have you uh, in Rotterdam. Uh, it's uh, organized in connection with DITA Europe, but uh, uh, so this is in the, the day before DITA Europe. It makes it easy for uh, people interested in DITA to attend both events if they want to. And as I mentioned, it's a, it's a free event. Uh, and we have the main DITA Open Toolkit developers, Yarno, Elovirta, Robert Anderson, and a lot of uh, other uh, data uh, users and developers. So we'll be happy to have you there. You have the agenda, you have all the information on our website. So company events is where you find uh, uh, all the webinars and the uh, conferences that we go and so on. So I think we are at the end of our uh, session. Thank you, Alex, and thank you for joining us. Thank you all for joining us. I hope you uh, you found, found this uh, useful and we look forward to meet you either virtually at one of the upcoming webinars and maybe in person at uh, uh, one of the upcoming events where we go. So, right. Thank you and have a thank nice you. day. Thank you all for attending. Bye-bye.